like to talk to you all today about our proposal for the RISC-V privilege architectures. Um, and uh, although I guess we're running a little bit late here, the good news is that they're so simple, we'll probably still make it a lunch on time. Um, so my goal isn't exactly to convey all the details of the design, because after all, you can just go download the spec and read it, but rather just to uh, hit on some of the high notes, so you know, to stimulate discussion and get some feedback. Um, we haven't frozen the spec yet, as the title of the talk implies, and although I think we're, we've arrived at a pretty reasonable design, uh, there's still plenty of time to change course if need be. So uh, your feedback, of course, will be welcome. So uh, I'd say that designing the privilege architecture is mostly an exercise in interface design, and the reason I say that is because the main goal is to uh, provide a clean split between the various layers of the stack. The reason this is really important is because it, divide, it allows you to divide and conquer the task of porting application and system software, which is by far the most expensive uh, aspect of bringing up a new, uh, a new architecture. Um, so with that in mind, you know, regardless as to what's happening under the hood, um, an application, it interacts with its execution environment by way of uh, a standard interface, which we call an application binary interface, an ABI. Um, you know, pretty standard terminology there. But, uh, so we'll call the thing that's actually running on top of an application execution environment, or AEE. Um, so the AEE is important, but the whole point of the ABI is that the application doesn't need to know what's going on under the hood, how the AEE is implementing it, as long as it knows that it faithfully implements the ABI. So we'd like to generalize that notion beyond just application software, but also to the OS and to other system software as well. And so in a RISC-V system, the supervisor software, I mean the OS, uh, it interacts with a supervisor execution environment, or SEE, via a supervisor binary interface, or SBI, completely analogous to the story with an application running on top of an application execution environment via an ABI. So um, likewise, the OS doesn't need to know the details of what's going on in, uh, in, the, uh, in the SEE implementation as long as the SEE faithfully implements the SBI. And maybe the SEE is itself a hypervisor, and the story is similar there. The hypervisor run runs on top of a hypervisor execution environment, which it communicates via an HBI, and the, inter and the implementation is irrelevant as long as it's a faithful in implementation of the interface. So all these levels in a RISC-V system are designed to support virtualization. Um, they are uh, clearly defined interfaces, and it should make the task of bringing out things like OSs and hypervisors somewhat easier. At least that's the goal. So underlying the implementation of one of the uh, execution environments is a hardware abstraction layer. Um, and just like the, uh, the goal of the various interfaces I talked about is to uh, make the things above them agnostic to the implementation of the things below them, uh, the goal of the HAL is to uh, abstract the, the uh, actual hardware platform from the implementation of those execution environments. Now, obviously, it can't be turtles all the way down. Um, at some point, some piece of software actually needs to know what's going on inside of the machine. But the hope here is that for a given platform, you only have to write a relatively small amount of code once. And then you can re you reuse all the existing hypervisors and operating systems and applications and whatnot without having to change them at all. So uh, in our proposed architecture, uh, we've defined four privilege modes user mode, a supervisor mode, hypervisor mode, and machine mode. And as you can probably guess, those are an increasing order of privilege level. Um, so only machine mode has completely unfettered access to all the hardware features. And so naturally, machine mode is mandatory. Um, however, all the other three uh, privilege levels are um, optional. You can choose not to implement them. And depending on the uh, kind of system you're building, the application domain, the level of, uh, of isolation you desire between the application and the system, uh, you can choose uh, you know, which, which modes to add in addition. So for example, if you're building just a simple microcontroller, you might stick with machine mode only. Um, of course, you know, implicitly you trust the application if you're doing that. Um, some more complicated embedded systems might want some isolation between the system software and the application, and so distinguish user mode from machine mode. And you know, if you're running a traditional Unix-like OS, then you're going to add supervisor mode as well. And if you want efficient virtualization support, then you can add in the H mode, the hypervisor mode as well. But uh, the simplest systems don't need to be burdened with the more comp complicated privilege levels. So uh, to touch on some example implementations, um, the, uh, you know, I, I mentioned that a simple embedded system might only have machine mode. So in this mode, um, there is no memory protection, no address translation, virtual addresses equal physical addresses, and application code can basically do whatever the hell it wants. Um, so inherently, the application code has to be trusted in this kind of system. Um, 
So uh, as an aside though, even though there is no memory translation, we recommend that implementations still do things like trap, trap bad physical addresses precisely at the core because that makes debugging substantially simpler. Um, and uh, it, makes, it makes it less costly to bring up systems that way. It's also pretty cheap to do. Um, so uh, machine mode by itself is actually very cheap to implement. So using just say the user ISA as a baseline, uh, the only additional stuff you have to add are a handful of instructions and on the order of like 100 bits of architectural state. That's the stuff you need for basic trap handling, like you know, the exception program counter, um, you know, the bad virtual address and whatnot. Um, and uh, if you need a little bit more functionality, like, uh, like timers and timer interrupts, there's you know, another 100 bits or so of state you need to add for that, and a little more if you want some basic performance uh, counter facilities, like instructions retired and cycle counts and stuff like that. So it's really not a whole lot of hardware. Now, um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, even, even some embedded systems do want some isolation between uh, application and system software. And so we wanted to provide a way of doing that without requiring full page-based virtual memory. And our means for doing that was to uh, add basic base and bounds addressing support, uh, where, addressing translation and protection, wherein um, physical addresses are computed by adding a base to whatever application virtual address you have. And uh, the virtual addresses are also bounds checked, so you can't go out of range and say clobber the system uh, memory space. Um, so this is pretty simple to implement. You need a base register and a bounds register, you know, another, another uh, carry save adder and a comparator. So not a whole lot of hardware for a substantial improvement in isolation. Um, so we also defined something a little bit more sophisticated, uh, a dual base and bound system where, in, where instructions and data are translated separately from each other. Uh, the main advantage to this is that you can uh, share code segments between programs. Um, the uh, Cray supercomputers use this pretty effectively. Um, you can, you can multi-program with these uh, to a great degree as long as all the memory for the programs fit in physical memory at any given time. Um, and uh, it's not especially costly to implement. Um, also, as compared to a page-based virtual memory system, it's worth pointing out that addressing translation, addressing translation and protection are very cheap here um, because it's just, you know, addition and comparison, not, you know, say TLB lookups and misses and whatnot. But, you know, you do need that sometimes. And if you want to run a full-featured OS, you probably do want page-based virtual memory support because that's a pretty typical assumption of those operating systems. Um, so we designed our supervisor modes to be, you know, pretty vanilla so that they would be easy to port the Unix-like OSs to. Probably Windows 2, but don't really know what the hell's going on inside of there. Um, so uh, we called RV32's uh, supervisor mode with 32-bit virtual addresses SV32. That's supervisor mode with 32-bit virtual addresses is how you decode that. And it's a pretty conventional design. It's uh, the same as like IA32's, for example, where you have 4K pages and a two-level page table where the page tables are constrained to be the same size as a page. Um, uh, we also support, uh, at any level in the page table, uh, super pages. Um, we've, uh, tried to fix the terminology, which we think is kind of broken in existing systems, and, and, and name each level of them. So the page that's bigger than a base page is called a mega page because its size is on the order of a megabyte. Um, the, uh, the story for RV64 is pretty similar to RV32. We don't populate the full 64-bit address space necessarily. Um, there's a bit of a tension between the amount of virtual address space you provide and the cost of address translation. Like, you know, the number of levels in the page table dictate how long a TLB miss takes to satisfy, and the size of the structures in the hardware that hold virtual addresses have to get bigger as well. So we actually defined a handful of RV64 virtual addressing modes, the uh, smallest of which has a little bit less than a terabyte of address space, but only three levels in the page table, versus uh, you know, an increasing page table depth and increasing address space size for the various other modes. So these are all pretty compatible with each other. The design between all of them is the same. So it's relatively straightforward if you say support SV57, you, there's no reason not to support SV48 and SV39 as well. So moving along. Um, one of the most contentious discussions we had in defining the ISA was what the base uh, page size should be. I mean, I know that sounds kind of mundane, uh, but you know, originally uh, our design from a couple years ago used larger page sizes for the uh, for the designs with larger integer registers. So you know, 8K pages for RV64 and 16K pages for RV128. Um, and the, the rationale here was that you get better TLB reach and smaller miss penalties because you don't need as many levels in the page table and uh, the pages themselves are larger so you get, you get fewer uh, cold misses in the TLB. Um, now, um, we were disabused of that notion. Uh, now, why would that be the case given that there are clear advantages to it? Well, 
The first one is uh, the realities of porting low-level software. And what you see up here on the screen is a code segment from a popular threading library whose name, well, I shall not name. Uh, and if you see what's going on here, they're using hard-coded integers to, per to perform memory allocation in this case. And this code will fail on a system with, uh, with, page, with a page size bigger than 4K. Now, um, as it turns out, this unnamed thread library is Berkeley, so you might say that this is some, you know, ivory tower incompetence or something like that. But, uh, uh, but you know, I hear from people that this crops up all the time. And being that software porting costs are so dominant, you know, erring on the side of compatibility seems like a rational thing to do. Now, there's also a more legitimate technical reason, I think, uh, for sticking with the 4K pages, which is that the larger the base page size is, the more internal fragmentation you get. That's especially bad for things like file caches, uh, where there are lots of small objects, but they, need, but they need to be dedicated to pages because of things like disk block size. Um, and so if you end up wasting physical memory capacity because of, the smaller, because of larger pages, then the benefit starts to re be reduced. Um, there's also a mitigating factor that's worth mentioning. Um, in recent years, uh, transparent super page support in Linux and BSD has actually gotten reasonably good. Now what this is, is when you have a long run of contiguous virtual addresses um, that, that uh, could be mapped by a super page, the OS can dynamically promote that mapping to use the larger page size transparently to the application code. Um, and of course there are, there are constraints under which this can happen. There can't be too much memory pressure, for example. But when it works, it, uh, it does a much better job at reducing you know, the, uh, the address translation costs than say using 8K pages would. Um, so between all this, I think the upshot is that we just have to bite the bullet, suck it up, and make 4K pages go fast. Um, I don't actually think that that's uh, an intractable problem. Uh, you know, obviously people don't want to build arbitrarily large TLBs, but the fact of the matter is, if you can afford a large cache, you can afford the TLB that can map uh, the address space of the cache. It's, it's smaller by a factor of at least 100. So I guess the answer is deal with it. Now, um, uh, a few years ago, we uh, defined an RB128 ISA. That's a 128-bit address space variant of RISC-V. It was a little tongue-in-cheek. It was kind of a joke when we did it at first. But you know, it, we realized very shortly thereafter that actually the number of uh, unique bytes in a data center is actually going to be approaching that limit not too long from now, especially you know, as, uh, as non-volatile memory gets denser and cheaper. Um, and so we decided that we'd, uh, we'd spec that out, and we uh, also spec out the address translation schemes for RV128 as well. This is just a proposal. We are not actually building these systems yet. But, uh, uh, but, but for now, what we're thinking about doing is just uh, performing the natural extension from RV32 and RV64 supervisor modes to RV128. So you end up with these very deep page tables to have uh, large address spaces. But we have some ideas for how to mitigate the TLB uh, miss costs by skipping levels in the page table uh, in cases where the address space is sparse and you don't actually need all of the entropy in the address. Um, it's worth mentioning that we considered using inverted page tables both for the larger RV64 systems and for RV128. But um, in looking through the literature, it seems like the, uh, the, the, the number of DRAM accesses per TLB miss is actually higher for those systems than, than even very deep page tables. And so the thought for now is to not do that. Um, also, we uh, def defined some small address space variants for uh, RV128 as well, because I think that there are probably going to be use cases where people want wide integer registers uh, just for the sake of those, not necessarily wide addresses. And there's no reason to unduly penalize the performance of those systems. So another uh, a rather contentious issue, to say the least, actually almost came to blows the other day, uh, was, uh, the, was the issue of how to encode uh, physical memory attributes in, um, in the memory system. And a you know, pretty typical thing to do, in fact, I think in all the major commercial systems, is to encode things like cacheability as fields in the page table entry. And uh, we assert strongly that that is the wrong place for that. Um, so there are a few reasons for that. For one, uh, the granularity of, uh, of, of, of the permissions you're setting is not necessarily the same as the page size. In fact, they rarely correlate to each other. Um, and also, you know, it, it kind of screws up virtualization a little bit because you're tying platform information to a virtualization layer. I think, uh, I guess a slightly more uh, emotional appeal for this is, is just that they really have nothing to do with each other. The physical memory properties and the address translation scheme have nothing to do with each other, and the only reason that people put cacheability bits in the PTEs is because it's a convenient place to stash them. Um, 
So I think a mitigating factor of this decision is also that like, it might not matter as much in the SOC era going forward. And uh, the, 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 the two justifications for that claim are that, uh, for one, if you know all your devices at design time, you may well know the properties of all physical addresses at design time. And so this just, just can be baked into the masks. And there's no reason to have any dynamic state that controls these properties. Um, the, uh, the other is that, you know, in, w in the era of more and more on-chip integration, we're kind of hoping that incoherent DMA is going to go the way of the dodo, and so there won't be any need to deal with uh, incoherent accesses to memory that I.O. has touched. I mean, knock on wood. All right, so changing gears a little bit. Um, we've tried to expose the simplest possible interrupt model to supervisor software that we possibly can. So in particular, what I mean is there's actually only three kinds of interrupts that the supervisor mode even needs to know about. There's timer interrupts, which are what you'd expect. The only thing that's any different from how um, other systems work is that they're based on the wall clock, not based on cycle counters. Um, software interrupts uh, are those that are generated mostly by other cores sending interprocessor interrupts. And finally, the thing that's a little bit different here is that there is only one kind of device interrupt in a, that a RISC-V supervisor system sees. Um, so uh, the idea is that we're going to expose a virtualized interface to all devices, even in systems where you're not running a hypervisor. And there, you know, the reasons for this are twofold. For one, it simplifies implementing the virtualized layer. Uh, but for two, it also isolates the OS from driver code, which is notoriously buggy, and, uh, and isolating those two from each other should improve system stability. Um, that's a hypothesis, not a fact. Um, now, nothing's actually stopping you from doing the old crappy traditional OS model where the OS is going to control the entire system. You can write code that runs in machine mode. You can you know, run Linux with complete control over the system. You know, God bless. But we're advocating that you not do that, and we're, sketch and we're sketching out the privilege mode so that, to, as to not encourage that. So uh, another thing that uh, is not quite novel but still diverges from you know, the, uh, the x86 and ARM state of the art is to uh, abstract as much of the OS interface as possible behind the supervisor binary interface. Uh, it's kind of akin to what, uh, what digital did with the PAL code and the alpha. Um, but uh, so a lot of common functionality that ordinarily you would expose by say like you know poking various like uh, control registers or uh, or writing magical I/O memory locations is actually just done via function calls into an API, and these are things like querying the system for what the physical memory map is, asking what the list of devices are, you know, getting your core ID. Um, tying into Curse's talk uh, from a few minutes ago, saving and restoring uh, coprocessor state. For example, the OS doesn't need to actually know at compile time how long the hardware vector length is. It can just query this thing to see what the uh, size of the opaque state object is and just call functions to save and restore the state without having to know exactly how to do so. Um, so other things like setting up timer interrupts or SBI calls, which should simplify the implementation of the hypervisor, IPIs, TLB shootdowns, reboots, stuff like that. And uh, the, the, the two motivating reasons here are that uh, suppose I decide to add hardware acceleration for a given function, like say I want to have co hardware coherent TLBs so I don't have TLB shootdowns anymore. If I expose that as an SBI call, that SBI call could just turn into a no-op, and all existing supervisor software can take advantage of that feature without having to change the code at all. Uh, whereas if I did not have it behind this abstracted interface, then only patched software could take advantage of the, uh, of the vastly improved performance of, uh, of that feature. Um, the other is that, uh, is that abstracting these things should simplify the implementation of hypervisors, and uh, for that matter, the, uh, uh, the, the supervisor execution environments in general. Um, just by virtue of exporting a higher level interface. So uh, we haven't actually published a draft of, uh, of our supervisor binary interface. We have a working one that our Linux port's written against, and we plan for the next release of the privileged ISA to uh, um, have a draft of the SBI out as well. So um, I'm happy to say that we did all of this, only adding four instructions to the ISA. I think part of that is because of the uh, of, of of using higher level abstractions for you know for handling uh, the the the, you know, the various primitives the OS needs. But um, you know you can see them up on the screen. There's just uh, basically TLB flushes, exception returns, uh, the ability to redirect traps from from uh, various privilege levels to various other privilege levels, and uh, one rather important uh, primitive which uh, halts the processor until an interrupt becomes available.
So uh, as I mentioned at the uh, beginning of the talk, uh, we designed all of this to be, uh, to, to be fully virtualizable. And of course, you can do that using classic virtualization techniques where you just run an OS in user mode on top of a hypervisor that is running either in user mode or in supervisor mode. Um, so uh, we, as far as we know, there are no holes in the RISC-V user ISA that, that, that complicate this, like, you know, like e-flags in x86, for example. So classic virtualization should just work out of the box. But you know that's not especially fast, and for good reasons, people want hardware virtualization, hardware acceleration for virtualization to speed things up. Um, I'm sorry to say, too bad. It's not there yet, uh, but it will be. And I think that this is going to be that the H mode extension is going to be one of the first things that the uh, foundation shepherds and defines over the course of the next year or so. Um, and hopefully, the act of doing so should be easier by virtue of the higher level uh, API calls from the uh, OS into the hypervisor. So uh, where are we on all this? Um, well, the, uh, the Berkeley implementations uh, of everything are up to the new 1.7 draft, the, the one that's posted on the RISC-V website. Um, the, uh, the Spike, the ISA simulator, supports uh, RV32, SV32, and RV64, SV39. Uh, our two uh, application cores, Rocket and Boom, uh, which are RV64 cores, support the 39-bit virtual address space supervisor variant. Um, and Zscale, which you'll hear about uh, tomorrow from Yunsup, uh, right now is a machine mode only implementation with no address translation, but the plan is ultimately to support the base and bounds addressing mode and page-based virtual memory as optional uh, configuration parameters for the core. We're hoping that Zscale will be the smallest core you can run you know, full, Linux, full Linux on, you know, aside from a Turing machine or something. Uh, so um, the, we haven't actually taped out the latest version of the supervisor spec. Uh, we've taped out several previous versions. Uh, we're expecting that as part of the hurricane project that's ongoing research at UC Berkeley that the first version of this will be taped out sometime in September, or sorry, the 1.7th version. Uh, as far as software goes, um, Linux is uh, up to date, written against the new draft and against the F SPI. We have multi-core Linux running, um, and I guess it's implicit in saying that, but also the compiler tool chain is, uh, is up to date with the new spec as well. As far as specifications go, really by far the most important part, um, we're hoping to uh, get uh, the, the next version of the draft out, 1.8, sometime this summer, and hopefully that will be very close to you know, being ratifiable, and we hope to freeze this uh, as version 2.0, as we are wont to do uh, sometime in the fall semester. Um, and uh, that's all I've got, but uh, courtesy of the New Yorker, uh, I guess it's time to open up the floor to shorter speeches designed as questions. Yeah. So this is actually a question, not a speech. I hope that's okay. <laughs> Great. Um, so, so you said that the, the supervisor binary interface has concepts of things like timers and so forth. Will, do you expect that that's implemented in some machine code software running in M, or is the, uh, is the hardware itself going to be providing that directly? Uh, real quick, would you mind stating your name and affiliation? Sorry, Adam Langley, Google. Okay, yeah, uh, so that's the expectation, and the standard way of doing so is specified in the documentation, if you take a look, for how this works in machine mode. Uh, if you're running on top of a hypervisor, of course, you wouldn't directly access those features. The hypervisor would presumably do things like multiplex the machine mode counter uh, to schedule timer interrupts for multiple OSs, but that's the idea. So, so when you said that's the idea, which of the ideas? Uh, both, depending on whether you're running on a, on a hypervisor or not. Ah, okay, thank you. Uh, Prashant Munkur from SRI. Uh, I had two questions. There doesn't seem to be any mention of interrupt priorities in the privilege spec. Um, I was wondering whether that was intentional. Yeah, uh, that's something we should write about, but, the, uh, but I think part of the answer is that that should be a platform-specific issue, um, and uh, it is an important one, though. And the second one was the choice of 34-bit uh, physical addresses for R32. Right. Uh, so uh, for those who have not looked at the manual yet, uh, what's being referred to is that the, uh, in RV32, in, in SV32, we support a 34-bit physical address. So you can support uh, more physical memory than you can actually address within any given process. Uh, the reason we picked that number is because that was what fit in the page table entry, and we figured why not do so. Of course, implementations that are known to have less memory can omit the bits and save hardware. Because it might create complications for devices that are doing DMA. Uh, in that case, the system software can restrict them to the lower four gigs of physical address. Peter Tashin, uh, Naval Progress Graduate School. So is there, uh, maybe I missed this, uh, a sleep or deep sleep interrupt software option? 
Uh, that should, that's a platform issue, and yes, I think most platforms will provide such a thing. Okay, yeah. thank you. Tommy Thorne, still unaffiliated. Uh, there's a lot of features that you need from x86 to do uh, servers, for example. And for example, the one I miss is a similar weight on changes to memory, like M weight. Mm -hmm. What is the story here? I knew there would be a shorter speech. Um, the, uh, so, so I think that the, the wait for interrupt instruction could naturally be extended to a more general like wait for event mechanism, which could, for example, be used to wait for a memory address to be touched. Right now, there's nothing like that spec. Hi, Arun Thomas, BA Systems. Um, do you guys are you working on a specification for the interrupt controller and some of the other platform? peripherals that are kind of necessary? Not actively, but that is something that we need to do. Uh, it's, it's entirely possible that some platforms will just take one off the shelf, I think, cool. and you know, interact, with, interact uh, with it with platform-specific memory mapped I.O. accesses. Oh, uh, Zscale. Uh, what, 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 Krista? Yansak will talk about that tomorrow. Did you consider doing multiple page sizes? Uh, yes, we considered that, but, uh, but the preponderance of the evidence was we should stick to 4K as the base page. So huge, huge pages are quite commonly used in, uh, in Linux. Right, so you can get the 2 meg uh, super pages in RV64 through transparent promotion. Okay, yeah. cool. As long as there's something there for, to use. Uh, so Dave asks what the difference between super pages and multiple page sizes are. Uh, so super pages are an aligned block of all of the pages that that upper level of the page table could map, whereas some architectures actually have an option for changing what the base page size is on a per process or per OS granule. So the super page thing works much more naturally with, the, uh, with, with, with existing software and makes it so you can uh, have some processes using some pages and other processes using, uh, using small pages and big pages and so forth. Right. Hi, uh, Sam, unaffiliated. Um, so I'm working on a project um, that may involve the use of DMA. My question is, um, I've seen several definitions of what coherent DMA means. One is um, your cache simply snoops the bus and every time an external device writes to memory, then it invalidates that cache line. In other cases, I've seen it where it refers to a very specific bus protocol that's in use. When you use the term coherent uh, DMA, what do you mean? I was being deliberately vague, but the former is closest to what I mean. I'm agnostic to the way it's implemented, but what I mean is when the processor loads from an address the device is stored to, that it gets the most recently written data and vice versa. Perhaps by invalidations is the mechanism. Thanks, everyone.